So we spent the last two days talking about capabilities around creativity and capabilities around having that wide open view in the periphery that is looking at the, uh, the signals and the inputs and the insights in the world around us. What are we hearing from our members? What are we hearing from our colleagues? What are we seeing in the marketplace? And we worked through that creativity process to come up with solutions that uh, you all shared with each other and us all here today during your million dollar sentence. So now we're going to, uh, to work with, and I'd like to invite up uh, Mr. Devenagruta, who is uh, going to help us uh, build that capability around the business model development. So how can we take our creative idea and wrap a value around it. So how can you build out a plan that will get the CFO to say yes, that not only brings and delivers a great idea to your customer, but one that supports your organization's financial objectives, ongoing uh, stability objectives, and you know, the concept of, from a credit and perspective, we've got perspective, we've got members. It's the individual who we're trying to serve. But each one of those members is also a part of the membership. And sometimes serving a member and serving the membership can be different. And serving the membership talks about delivering value, creating value in your concept to, to, uh, to really support the organization. So, so a few points about uh, Devendra Gupta. His mission is to equip 21st century passion-driven entrepreneurs with four things, and they all start with a C. Clarity, commitment, confidence, and the courage to make a positive difference. So I, I, the one thing that really stood out to me was the positive difference. And I think uh, we're all here, we've all got a, a social objective with our organizations. And uh, you know, there's certainly a lot to be combined with that social objective and the, and the talent that comes around business model development. And his passion really is in helping innovative teams get things done. So we heard from Roger Perrin this morning talk about not only the result, but the process. So the vendor is going to help us really understand what is the process to take that idea and help build the value to get it to become reality. Um, Devender started off, he uh, was uh, with the Royal Canadian Air Force in their research and development uh, division area for 15 years, so he certainly has a very uh, interesting start. He is a business leadership coach with Startup Academy here in Canada, and most interestingly, he was named one of Canada's top 10 mentor rock stars by Startup Canada. So I'd like to introduce Devendra Gupta to come up to the stage and uh, please let's all give him a round of applause. So, um, I'm really, really happy to be here. My name is Devender, and if you want to tweet anything, my Twitter handle is Coach Devender. Just a little bit of gratuitous self-promotion, of course. Um, and uh, this afternoon, I want uh, to share with you the mindset of a startup and how we approach develop, turning an idea into a business model that a startup can, after that, start executing. And uh, I'm going to divide this afternoon into two parts. First part is innovate like a startup, so some of the, the concepts around it. And then after that, the second part will be the business model canvas, the specific tool that I use with my startups from the beginning to help get them started. Um, at any time, if you have questions, feel free to get up and ask questions as I speak. And si vous voulez faire vos questions en français, ça me ferait plaisir aussi de pouvoir répondre. So, here we go. Innovate like a startup. Just to give you an idea of my background, so as Andrew mentioned, um, my first career was in aerospace research and development in the Canadian Air Force. And that gave me uh, a really strong uh, project management uh, skills. And so when I decided to leave the military and launch my own business, I thought I knew everything there is to know about the business. Because what is a business? It's basically a project on a bigger scale, of course. And so I did the small business startup courses and I launched my first business and I borrowed lots of money from my bank and I realized that um, that's not how you start a business, not by borrowing money. You have to first figure out how to create value. And uh, that led me to a uh, $10 million startup at the end of the 90s. Uh, there was myself and a group of people uh, in the area of health informatics, health information systems. 
And so we got lots of money, we hired lots of people, we went up like all the startups did at the end of the 90s, and then we crashed right back down that fast. And then that's where I learned that it can't be just all business, there has to be project management in it also. So that's what led me to become a uh, business leadership coach. And I've been working in Calgary, uh, Toronto, and for the past uh, eight years now, I've been based in Quebec City. And I work with all different types of technology startups, whether it's web, green tech, um, uh, or um, mechanical engineering, industrial applications. Uh, I've worked with um, an electronics engineer who developed a, a musical instrument that's used uh, uh, by a lot of new age artists and also in the, um, in, in the advertising industry. Um, I've worked with uh, all different kinds of projects. And when I was uh, talking with George um, just earlier this afternoon, it was, it's not the idea that's important. It's how you turn it into a system a system that creates, delivers, and harvests value. That's the important part. The best ideas in the world are of no use unless they're put to work creating, delivering, and harvesting value. So that's what the startup mindset is all about. So let's jump right in. The lean startup methodology. Why do we call it lean? Well, it comes from the manufacturing background. And lean is not doing it on the cheap. It's not doing it, not doing it uh, with um, uh, uh, just with the, what you have at hand. Lean is about every action you do should create a result that is worth something to somebody. And in this case, every action that you're doing in developing your idea, in building the business model around it, how you're creating, you're delivering, and you're harvesting value should create something of value for somebody. Otherwise, it's waste. So lean from the sense of, we don't want to build something that nobody wants. And that's wasteful, that is, that is excess, that is something to be avoided. So the lean startup methodology is about this mindset of from the start, we're trying to figure out where to find that sweet spot in the idea where you're maximizing the impact, the positive impact that you're creating for people. So business is evolving, and uh, the market is evolving, people are evolving, expectations are evolving, the economy and the rules of the economy are evolving. And so the way we launch business projects has to change also, and it has to evolve. It has to become much more agile, plugged in, personal, distinctive. Being competent is not enough anymore. You have to really stand up, you have to, deliver the, um, uh, the 20 times value, the 100 times value, the 1,000 times value. And the way <clears throat> today, the way that the value of business is, especially in the startup space, the way they're measured is not about how much money is coming in or the value of the products that have been shipped. It's all about how many people flock to your solution and that, that attractiveness is what is driving now the valuation of these companies. And when you think of uh, the, um, the latest one, the WhatsApp was bought by Facebook for how many billion dollars, 19 billion dollars. How many people worked in that, in, in that startup? Maybe 50, let's say 100, you know, by being generous. So it very much is about doing something that's distinctive, that makes a difference in the world. And that's the message that I keep on telling my startups. It's great having an idea of how to do something, but it's the what and the why and the who are that which are really important. People don't care about what you do. And I enjoyed your, your, um, uh, your million dollar sentences at the beginning, but what, personally, what I was sort of um, uh, left wanting to know more about is what you do for me. That's really what I want to know. And that's, that's the purpose of this lean startup methodology, this innovating like a startup. It's getting really, really clear from the beginning, before you write a line of code, before you invest in doing anything to execute your project, figuring out who are you doing something for and what are you doing for them with your idea. So 
business, of course, it starts with an idea. I have an idea, I see an opportunity, or there's something that's important to me. It comes from a person, a person that has an idea, that wants to do something. Then the next step is to try and figure out how that idea connects with the needs, the wants, the priorities, the desires, the values, the dreams of the user, of the client, of the other person, or the other stakeholders. And so, which means that it's not the whole idea which is important, it's part of the idea which is important. You want to find out what that intersection is between what I want to do and what you need. So that's the first thing you want to find in the Lean Startup methodology when you want to innovate like a startup. And then after that is to figure out what are the resources that you have to apply to this or the resources that you need to get. Whether it's money, it's people, it's technology, uh, it's knowledge, it's experience, it's branding, whatever it is. You want to figure out what you need. And that's what gives you that profit zone. Profit in the, in the large sense. Profit tangible, cash flow, revenue streams, all that kind of stuff. And intangible, the, the way you make people's lives better. And the tangible and intangible have to be in there. And we look at that from the beginning when we're trying to figure out what is the business model, how we're going to create, deliver, and harvest value. Now the danger is you don't want to get stuck in where there's only the intersection of two elements. Because either you end up in a space where there's no demand, because you're doing something you love and you think it's going to work, and you have the resources to do it, but you haven't yet connected with what people want and what people need and what people are looking for or what they think they're looking for. Oh. Or you end up over-promising. And that's what happened in my startup, my $10 million startup at the end of the 90s. We were, we were over-promising, way over-promising on the technology and on our idea. Uh, at, at the time, the health and informatics space was really driven by Y2K. I don't know if you remember that. We all thought the world was going to end on, uh, at midnight on January 1st, 2000. And uh, that freed up a lot of money. So money was really easy to get and very quick to spend. But we were, very, uh, we were way over optimistic about what the technology could do, but also our capability of delivery. We had smart people, but we didn't have the systems in place. So we overpromised, and we didn't have the means to carry it out. So the whole thing collapsed. Or thirdly, if I focus too much on what people want, but it's not connected to why I want to do it, then I have no energy, I have no passion, and the project just doesn't work. The startup just doesn't get off the ground, people get bored, they start looking at other things to do. So you want to be in that, in that center spot of the three. And that means, I, I come back to this fundamental definition of what business is about, it's how you create, how you deliver, and how you harvest value. So with your idea, you're implementing your idea and, and you're generating a, a change in the status quo, a change in the world through, you, through what you're offering. And then you deliver that change to the people who want it, who recognize the value of what you're doing, and who want to commit to it. And that commitment is the, is the harvest that comes back. And so it makes this cycle, and you build a system around it. And that's a very different way of thinking for a lot of these startups who start going, uh, they think it's all about the website, or it's all about the product, and it's all about the technology. But investors in startups are not interested in technology. They couldn't care less. What they want to know is how you're going to create, deliver, and especially harvest a lot of value. This is a really good book. How many of you have read or heard of The Lean Startup? I highly, highly recommend it. Um, Eric Ries had a startup in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and, and he discovered this, the same kind of things that I had discovered in my own experience with a startup. It's that we were really busy doing stuff, but in the end, nobody really wanted it or what we wanted to build, we couldn't build it. So he started thinking about 
this approach that's used in programming, um, agile programming, which is a, an iterative way to you start with a, with a quick and dirty version of the code, and then you iterate it towards something that works and that, that delivers the result that you want to create. And that's where he got the idea for the Lean Startup. And he defines a startup as a human institution, which is really cool. It's the first guy who, who recently, in recent uh, times, can talk about startups as being human. And that shocked a lot of people, but it is. And it's designed to create and deliver a product or service in conditions of extreme uncertainty. Because the startup world, when you're in the startup world, you're building a market, you're creating a demand, you're doing something that's never been done before. As opposed to if I want to open a corner store, or if I want to open a fish market, I want to open a, a car repair garage, the templates are all there. You go on the Small Business Administration site and you can download all the business plans and everything is there. But in the startup world, everything needs to be invented. And that's the exciting part of it. But it is, first and foremost, all about the people. It's all about a human institution. Now, when Eric Pickens put this together, he, he divided the book, there's like two major parts. The first part is the methodology of the lean, but that the last part of the book, which most people skip, which I find very interesting, he talks about we need to invent a new type of accounting called innovation accounting. And what's most important nowadays in this very agile world where everything changes from day to day, from moment to moment, it's about how quickly an organization, a group, a team can learn. So the whole purpose of a lean startup those who really embrace the process, it's about continuous learning. Testing something in the world out there, and measuring the result, and then interpreting that result to adjust where you're going so that you're always trying to figure out what's going to happen three, six, 12 months ahead of now. And that's, that's the beauty of this approach, innovation accounting. And I highly recommend that you take a look at the book and skip the first part and go straight to that that part of the book. Now when Eric Ries was coming up with his idea, actually he was at, I believe, Stanford University, and Steve Blank was one of his uh, professors. And the, the original concept came out of a conversation between the two, between Eric and Steve. And Steve Blank wrote a really cool book called The Startup Owner's Manual. And in it, he defines a startup as being a search a search for a duplicatable, a repeatable, and scalable business model. So as long as you're in the search process, you're a startup. It's not about getting the money. It's not about just being uh, cool young people and having a foosball table and all of that. It really it is, it is about developing the mindset that you're always searching for the next. Because the world is changing so fast. That's the only way you can keep up, is by being ahead of it. And so the two together have been doing some great work. Eric has been focusing more on getting companies, larger companies now, to focus on adopting the mindset. And then Steve has been working on the mechanics of how to coach it, how to mentor it, how to get people to develop and use the tools. So using the, the lean startup methodology, you end up with a growth curve, the, the, the five stages of growth for a startup. And it starts with an idea. Everybody starts with an idea. And I always have a little chuckle when people knock on my door or, or email me or ring me up or Skype me or whatever. And they say, I have a great idea. Where can I get some funding? They think they're ready to be funded right away. The problem is, the idea is just an idea. It's in your head. It hasn't been tested in the real world yet. So the first step is to discover what is the, what is the, the, uh, the diamond in the middle of your idea. What is the, there's a whole bunch of pony poop around it. <laughs> so you want to clear all that away and really find that nugget. Find that one thing, that one impact. 
And I hear in your ideas that, that, that for your projects, you have a whole bunch of things that you want to do. The, the lean startup methodology is about finding that one impact and nothing else. You want to get down to the real essential. So in the definition pro the process, you're trying to figure out what is the specific urgent problem or the burning, aching desire that is waiting to be met. And what part of my idea solves that problem or feeds that desire? That one thing. Um, I feel like uh, uh, there was that movie, um, uh, uh, it was a Western movie um, with Billy Crystal, and he went out with his buddies out City in the slickers. City Slickers. Yeah, and Curly, the old guy, says, there's that one thing. And that's what it is. It's about finding that one thing. That's the definition. The definition stage. And that can take a long time. And nobody's going to pay for it. Uh, in, in your organizations, nobody's going to pay for it. There's no outside investors that are going to pay for it. Everybody's waiting for you to find that. And you're in the definition stage until you find that thing. And when you say it, when you say it with your with your million dollar quest, uh, million dollar statement, your million dollar sentence, your elevator pitch, people go, I want it, I want it, I want it. You know, like the cookie monster, cookie, cookie, cookie. Well, this guy goes, solution, solution, solution. You want people to really eat it up. They want it so badly. That's really tough. It takes a lot of discipline and a lot of work to try and find that problem solution fit. But it's essential. You can't go to the next step until you figure that out. But once you do, once you find that ache, or that, that pain, or that desire, or that problem, once you find that, and you figure out what part of your solution fits to solving that, then you can go to the next one, validation. And the validation part is how much do people really want this? Yeah, they say they want it. Everybody says they want it. But how much do they really want it? Are they willing to reach into their pocket, take out their credit card, put it on the table? And that's the only market research that really counts, is when you want to get people to pay. So this is where we talk in the jargon, the startup jargon of, there's a, there's a crack here, I think I'm feeling like I'm going to fall off. Um, there's that, in startup jargon, it's called the MVP, the minimum viable product. And that's what you start building here to figure out how much are people willing to pay. And it's usually at this stage where a startup starts attracting some seed capital to build up their MVP and start validating that, yes, we know it's something that the market wants, but now we have to figure out how much they're willing to pay. Then the, mar then the first version goes out, and now you're about scaling up. It's about developing the solution and the systems uh, to be efficient and effective. And that's where the team starts to grow, and that's where you're on a path to eventually become the go-to reference for your market. So that's how lean startup methodology fits into a startup cycle. And it's the same thing inside organizations, inside businesses, inside teams. You want, you want to find your idea and equip it with the systems so you can create, deliver, and harvest value and have those systems respond to a need you want them to respond to a need that is immediate, that people want, that people crave, and then you can start building it out after that. So the startup mindset, to sort of summarize what we've talked about so far, so you're aiming to solve an important problem, something that's important, something that's urgent, by creating an offer which generates a huge added value. It's sort of like, toast and you put jam on it, you put more jam and more jam and more jam, so there's more jam than toast in the end. That's what you want. You want, you want the user to be just so bowled over by how great this is, by how much added value, that they're willing to pay many, many times in terms of not only the money that they put on the table, but paying other ways. Loyalty. Um, uh, uh, there's loyalty, they'll also talk, uh, talk about it to their friends. It'll sort of get the word of mouth going. All these different ways, attention, 
uh, it becomes a part of their lives and, and, and becomes something that, that people will adapt to. And think of Facebook. Facebook, really, deep down, what does it do? It doesn't do much, but what it does, it adds a lot of intangible to people's lives, so much so that whenever I'm in a workshop, I sometimes look over and I see, well, here's not too bad, you don't have your laptops open, but I often see people looking at their Facebook while I'm talking, <laughs> and they do the same thing too. I want to keep an eye on what's happening in my world. So Facebook has found a way to tap into this. And, and all, the, all the, the online tools that you use on a daily basis, I'm sure you can find tons of examples. So you want to figure out in the Lean Startup process and what we're going to be doing this afternoon, what is the return on use? Instead of return on investment, return on use. Because you want people not just to be invested in it, you want them to use it, because that's where you generate the value. Does their solution offer enough added value to motivate them to take out their wallet, to say yes, to commit, to use it, to click on it? And that is really, that is, that is the, the why finding that one question, that one problem that needs to be solved becomes so important. Because otherwise, you, if your offer is too spread out, people can't figure out what you're about. So you want to figure out what that return on use is. And when you've done so, you've discovered an opportunity that's worth investing millions of dollars and thousands of hours. Because over the years, that's what's going to cost. Whether you're a startup, whether you're, you're a project within an organization, you want this to be important. You don't want to just do a little thing. You want to do something that's big, which changes the status quo, that creates a disrupt. And in creating that disrupt, then you become the go-to solution. So yes, it's going to take a huge investment of effort, of time, of money. So is this problem worth all that investment, all that commitment? That's a really important question that I work with with my startups, and that's why I'm proud to say I have probably a 75% failure rate. After working with me, three out of four startups decide to quit. And I know it doesn't really sound great when I'm trying to sell my services to startups, but it's true. Better off doing this process at the beginning, spending 12, 16 weeks going through the process, trying to figure out what the, 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 the uh, jewel in the middle of that idea is all about. And then you know whether or not with a clear conscience should you continue or should you stop. Good to great. How many of you have, have heard of Jim Collins or this book? Great. Um, now, it's true that all the examples that he put in that book are either bankrupt or merged or disappeared. Let's put that aside. What I do like, though, is that while those businesses were alive, and they were still, they were the, the reference, the go-to reference in their categories. And why was that? It's because they focused on changing the world, on doing big, hairy, audacious shit. They wanted to do big stuff. Stuff that they're passionate about. Stuff that forces them, forces the team, forces the company to, to explore all their potential, and finally something that makes a dent in the universe. So all the big companies that you see leading today that are termed being innovators, that's what they're doing. They are they're choosing problems, they're choosing opportunities that really get their, their energy going. So think about, is what I'm doing, is it worth investing all this time, money, and energy? because it's going to take a lot of time, money, and energy. So if you're going to do it, do something big. Change the universe. Tom Peters is another one that I like. Um, I read, you probably see it, uh, a, uh, a, I'm dating myself a little bit, but when my startup uh, in, in the late 90s, early 2000s didn't take off, I did a lot of soul searching to figure out why it didn't work. And that's where I discovered some of these these thought leaders. And Tom Peters talks a lot about finding the wow. You want to find where's the emotion, where's the energy, the message 
You want, to, you want something that you'll build a tribe around. You'll build a community around your idea and what you're trying to do. Because it's the community and the tribe that's going to pull your project forward. So find the wow, find that exciting part. And when, and when the, the, the startups are doing, doing their work and at the end when they do the demo day, um, that's what we're looking to find. We want people that, that, that we, we want the startups to be able to express the core idea of what they're doing in such a way that everybody just gets so excited about it and hopefully the investors pull out their checkbooks and say, me, me, me. That's what we're trying to do. But also you want, that's the only way you're going to break through the noise. There's so many ideas out there. So you want to choose and work on ideas that are going to break through the noise. Game-changing results. Two other books that I absolutely love. The Innovator's Dilemma, Clayton Christensen. Uh, how many of you have, have heard about that? Okay, great. And Blue Ocean Strategy. Yes, Blue Ocean Strategy. It's a great way, and I'm not going to get too much into it today, but for follow-on reading, it's really good. They have some great tools on how to figure out what that added value is going to be. And that when you're creating value, what specifically is that value? How do you set yourself apart from the general market in what you're doing? And so uh, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And um, so what, that's what you want to do is find this quantum change. You want to spark this quantum change and add value. Not just a little bit better, but so much better that everybody throws out what they were doing before. That's what you want to find. So that's why we use the word disrupt. Disrupt. And that comes from Clayton Christensen. What does disrupt mean? Disrupt is all about provoking a change in the status quo that renders everybody else off the leap. Either what they're offering for value or how they charge for it or what they're doing. And so it goes beyond just the technology, but really into the value that you're creating, the change that you're creating in people's world. And uh, in uh, Bush and Strategy, they talk about four ways, four types of value innovation. Uh, so either about the what, the offer, the process, the market, or the value. So if in the offer, what you're looking at is, it really is the, the technology. It's an invention. It's something that hasn't been done before. And so most ideas have an element of offer innovation in it, which is OK. It's, uh, but it, it has to be there. But it's not the end of all. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's better. The other part is the process, new products or methods. So how you're doing it. Delivering something that already exists, but cheaper, better, faster, uh, more efficiently, uh, more customizably. Uh, and so the process innovation is more about how you're doing it internally. The end user might not see the result that much, but they will notice that it's a little bit better, they get it faster, those kinds of things. But the, but the added value is more internal than external. Market disruption, market innovation, is about opening a, a new market segment uh, that has been poorly served up until now. So it is um, an example in the, um, in the gaming space is when the Wii came out. Before that, uh, the video games were just for teenagers in their basements who were doing shoot-em-up shoot -em type stuff. But the Wii came along and used similar technology that was used before, but they packaged it nicely and they aimed it towards really young and really old people. Markets that were not properly served by existing, uh, by existing consoles and all of that. And it opened up gaming to a whole new group of people and made a lot of money for them. And then finally, value. Meeting a need that is valued by an existing market, but it's not really done properly. And for this, the best example is uh, the value of the budget airlines. Budget airlines, so what is the value that people want when they travel, or some people want when they travel by air? They want to do it as cheaply as possible. Or they're looking for frequency. Or they're looking for comfort. Or they're looking for fun. 
So you compete on one very specific, narrow dimension that sets you apart from others. Blue Ocean Strategy, I highly recommend the book. So that's why we talk about these different innovations, because it is how you, how you create this disruption uh, in the status quo in the market. So what Eric Gries does, he has created this lean cycle. And that's what we're going to start this afternoon. We're going to just kick off the lean cycle by setting up some hypothesis. OK, what do I think our user is? Who do I think our user is? What do I think is the value proposition, the value added that I'm giving this user? What do I think is the way we're going to deliver this value, the distribution channels? How are we going to build customer relations? So step by step is getting it out of the head and into paper, just like the scientific method, hypothesis. Then you build up a test. I'm going to test now. I'm going to test to see, is this, uh, is this really a problem with my target market? I do a simple, quick test. I deploy the test. I see, I deliver the test, and the test will give me some data, some metrics, which allow me to learn and adjust my hypothesis. And so by combining the scientific method that we all learned in high school with the, the, the business model canvas, which is a structure to help you to structure your thinking around how you create, deliver, and harvest value, you end up iterating. You, you evolve towards that finding that one point where you really make a difference. And, and the two big questions that you want to answer before you start coding, before you start building, before you start organizing or asking for money is, should we build this product? And can we build a viable business model to create, deliver, and, uh, and harvest value around this idea? So you want to know those two things before you go to the next step. And that's why I say in my case, 75% of startups don't progress beyond this step. Because they realize either, yes, it, it, it is a great product to build, but we can't figure out how to make it work as a business. And that is, that is great information to have. And then what you do is you take all the idea, you put it aside, you archive it, and then maybe next year something else comes up, the situation changes, and all of a sudden, some of the hypotheses around your business model start to work because the situation has changed. Great, then you can launch it. And that's why the, the part I was talking before about the resources, and it's not about just the resources in general, but it's where you are at. What I can do in Quebec City, in terms of the resources I have access there, is very different than what can be done here in Montreal, or what can be done in Silicon Valley. In Silicon Valley, uh, the, the amounts that are given as seed funding are much greater than what you get in Montreal, or even in Quebec City. So you want to answer those two questions before you go to the next step of your idea. The pivot is the magic word. The goal is to pivot. It's to, as you're looking for the truth, you're looking for that, that diamond in the middle of all the stuff, you're going to pivot, which is a major change to your business model that cascades into a whole bunch of other changes. And you want to make sure there are pivots towards where you want to go in the end. But it, that, is the, that is the measure, this learning that uh, I said I was talking about, um, uh, the, the um, knowledge accounting of, um, of the Lean Startup system. That's what it's all about, is measuring the number of pivots, counting the number of pivots. The more pivots you have, as long as you're not pivoting 360, but you're learning something each time, and the learning causes a change. You don't make a change unless you have data to back up why you want to pivot. And so change is good. Realizing that, OK, I started off with this idea, but now that we've tested some stuff, we realize that we have to change some of the, the fundamental hypothesis behind the idea. So now our idea has changed to be this. And that is a challenge to communicate that, especially to funders. Uh, higher up the chain. And that's why the business model canvas becomes a very good tool to do that. 
So what startups do? They're transforming ideas into tests, they're measuring how people respond to the tests, and then they use that information to decide whether to continue or to pivot. And so what you're trying to do is find those people who become the cookie monsters for your idea. So when they see what you're wanting to build, they go all crazy and they, and they, and they want it. The problem is, don't fall in love with your idea too early. Ideas are disposable. They're evolutionary. And that is the biggest problem for any team. And I go back to my experience with my startup in the late 90s. We fell in love with our ideas so much that we kept on pouring more and more and more money into it. And finally, we just couldn't make it work. And with this methodology, with this mindset, we could have saved ourselves a lot of problems. So everything that you put on paper, everything that you're working on right now, is all hypothesis. It's all in your head. And what you want to do is to validate through discovery, through testing, through research. Um, at the end of the afternoon, I'll give you some ideas of some tools that we use to do that. I won't get into the details today, um, but it's, it's something you have to keep in your mind all the time. Is when I put something on paper, okay, now how am I going to test this? Not how am I going to justify this, but how am I going to test this? If you leave today with that mindset, my job has been done. And what is it that I want to discover? Well, there was that, there was, oh yeah, he came up with a book, The Known Unknowns, uh, Donald Rumsfeld. You know, and he gave that, that famous speech, there's things that there's known knowns and there's known unknowns, and, but it's the unknown unknowns that we don't know. Well, that's basically what this chart is all about. This is the role of a startup. What you want to find as you're exploring your idea is to go beyond just what you know about what you know, your beliefs or your hypothesis. This is what you know. If it came out of your head, it's because you know it on some level. You want to go beyond that. You want to figure out what you don't know that you know. So your intuitions or ideally what you don't know about what you don't know. This is where, this is where the real value is. And today, uh, venture investors who are looking at doing seed investments in startups, they don't care about the technology. They want to know, Mr. Startup Entrepreneur, what have you discovered about the market that the market doesn't even know yet about itself, but that the market will discover about itself in about six to 12 months from now? So your goal, as, you're, as you are innovating and developing your idea, is to figure out what you don't know about what you don't know about what the market doesn't know about what the market doesn't know. <laughs> and when you've found it, well, if you've known it, it becomes another hypothesis that you have to continue iterating on. So you're always searching to figure out, it's not that people want faster horses. What do they really want? They want the mobility. So, okay, why do they want the mobility? Well, because they want to do this and this and this. Oh, okay, now we're starting to get to something really interesting. And using tools like the five whys. Have you ever heard of that? The five whys? Basically, when somebody gives you an answer, just repeat it back to them. Well, why do you want that? Why is this important? Why, why did this happen? And you keep on asking at five levels deep. And then you'll start to discover the real reason behind the first answer. So you're really digging to find out what is this insight? And that's where you can provoke the disrupt, provoke the change. So you're capturing ideas, you're defining hypotheses and validating them and selecting them and then executing on the ideas. And that's what startups do until they figure out the business model that is, that is sustainable and that is scalable. And you want to accelerate this and go faster and faster and, and because, okay, I have an idea, quick test, an idea, quick test results, idea, quick test results, and do it faster before you run out of money or run out of time or run out of people. So it is about search versus execution. That's, that is the bottom line in, in, uh, in the startup world using the lean startup methodology. So, yes, go ahead, build your Taj Mahal. Build your amazing idea. 
because it is something that somebody needs. And it doesn't have to be the whole world that needs it. As long as you find that somebody who needs it, and you can think about how you're going to build a, uh, a sustainable and scalable business model around it, that is what you're looking for. And so you want to be unreasonable. You want to have this passion that just pe other people don't understand. But that's the hallmark of a successful startup is when the, the, the founders have a passion, have a fire within them. And that's what makes it irresistible. And then you'll attract towards your project the resources, the people, the permission to make it happen. And yes, be audacious. You want to make a dent in the universe. You want to change the world. Because otherwise, what is it, what it, why go all through the heartache? So you want to do something that will stand the test of time because you've discovered a way to meet a need or a burning desire that helps people live their full potential, helps them live their full lives. So these are some of the books that I've mentioned. And in the handout that's going to go around later on, um, I'll mention there's at the bottom of the handout, there's a link that will lead you to this presentation and a whole bunch of other uh, resources, links to these books also. But I highly recommend that you read them. So that's how we innovate like a startup. Are you ready to start innovating like a startup? Yeah. OK. Should we take a quick break? And as we're doing that, go into your teams. Make sure you're in your teams. And I think there's some. Are we ready? Are we ready for break time? Okay. Let's go get some.